Chapter 3. Sabotage. No fire's warmth had ever felt so good. Not on the most bitter winter day, when her breath clouded in the brittle air, and she had to snowshoe through chest-high drifts to check her snares. Not even the time she had fallen through the ice into a stream, and her leggings had frozen so stiff she'd had to drag herself home. Suzette lifted her face to the sun, hugged the wool blanket more tightly around her shoulders, and edged closer to the flames. She was huddled on the sandy beach below Fort La Pointe. Miguec, Miguec, her parents were saying in thanks to the two Ojibwe men who'd seen their trouble and paddled out to pull Suzette from the lake. Miguec, Suzette echoed, but it came out a whisper, and she wasn't sure they'd heard. Mama, Mama pressed gifts of appreciation, a fishing lure, a pipe into their hands. Then Papa said a prayer, fingering his silver cross, and Grandmother offered tobacco to the lake in thanks for their safe passage. When the two men had gone, Papa gave Suzette one last crushing hug before turning back to the canoes. Grandmother began to brew some tea of wintergreen leaves and wild cherry twigs. Mama knelt by Suzette, stroking her hair. "'Daughter, you were foolish,' she scolded softly. "'Haven't we taught you better?' "'But, Mama, Papa was going to lose a bundle of furs. All our work. It would mean—' "'Hush. I know what it would mean. Do you think anything means more than your safety?' I didn't mean to scare you, Suzette mumbled. The crackling fire and pungent smell of burning pine were lulling her to sleep. I just knew we couldn't let Papa throw away his furs. It would have ruined everything. Stop talking and drink, Grandmother ordered, pouring a bowl of steaming tea. The women watched until she had finished, then coaxed her down on a blanket. Rest, they murmured, and Suzette was happy to obey. Drowsily, Suzette watched the men unload the canoes and pile the family's belongings near the fire. Charlotte fretted, and Ma Mama soothed her back to sleep with an Ojibwe lullaby. Suzette was just drifting to sleep when Papa's voice, sharp as a skidding knife, cut through her sleepy haze. Someone did this! Suzette opened her eyes. Papa and Yellow Wing were squatting beside Papa's canoe, now empty and resting upside down on the beach nearby. That's not possible! Yellow Wing bent close. Papa's face was as red as his hair. What else can it be? That seam was solid last night. You and I both inspected every seam in this canoe. Suzette knew it was true. She had watched Papa and Yellow Wing prepare the canoes for the crossing. They had restitched several several fragile seams in the birk bark with watab, split spruce root threaded through holes made with sharp awls. Then they had carefully sealed cracks with pine pitch. Papa and Yellow Wing knew their canoes like they knew their family. Look at this seam, Papa pointed. Most of the pitch was scraped away. If all of it had been removed, I would have seen it immediately. But just enough was taken to let us get out in deep water. Philippe, Mama breathed. She caught Papa's eye, then glanced at Suzette as if to say, Don't frighten your daughter. Suzette narrowed her eyes to slits, wanting to hear more. So Suzette's pretending to be asleep. After a moment, Yellow Wing said in a low voice, Someone was trying to harm you or the family? Perhaps just to scare me. Through the veil of her lashes, Suzette saw Papa's eyes spark like flint on a fire steel. But who? Yellow Wing let the sentence die as he glanced toward Mama. She shook her head. Grandmother's lips were pinched together. I don't know, Papa said grimly, but I would like to find out. He pushed to his feet. Come on, let's get these things moved up to the woods. I want to make camp. Suzette abandoned her pretense of sleeping and sat up, hugging the blanket close around her shoulders. Papa's discovery was chilling as spring snow. A man's canoe was among his most precious and necessary possessions. Each was painted with a unique design. Papa had painted a leaping fish on the bow of his. Everyone knew who it belonged to. Perhaps he's mistaken, she thought. He must be. No one had reason to wish Papa, or his family, any harm. Did they? The family began their first trip from the big beach up to the campground in brooding silence. Trying to push her troublesome thoughts away, Suzette drew a deep breath and took, the fami took in the familiar sights of La Pointe. The French trading post sat on the southwestern shore, just above the beach, in a big grassy meadow. A tall log stockade surrounded the post. Suzette noticed that a few logs had been replaced recently, giving the walls a funny striped look. Hundreds of wigwams already dotted the meadow by the fort. In a small field that had been scraped from the earth nearby, 
Suzette could see Ojibwe women planting potatoes, corn, and squash. As Suzette's family made their way to the campground, friends called to them from all sides. The family returned to their usual place beneath the pines at the meadow's edge, marked by lodge poles they'd left planted in the ground the year before. The framework is still good, Grandmother announced, examining the poles, which were bent and tied with basswood twine to form arches. Since the family would be here all summer, they had two wigwams or lodges, one for Mama, Papa, Suzette, and Charlotte, the other for Grandmother and Yellow Wing. Suzette helped cover the top of the dome-shaped frames with birch bark. She stood on tiptoe to hold the pieces in place while Grandmother and Mama lashed them to the poles. Next, they unrolled lengths of bulrush mats to cover the sides. They arranged the mats to allow breezes inside during hot days, and left a smoke hole in the roof so they could have a cook fire inside on rainy ones. Suzette inhaled the scent of fresh cedar boughs as she spread them on the ground inside and covered them with rush mats. In her own corner, she neatly folded her sleeping blankets and deer hides tan with the hair on them. Tying the lodge and making it snug against the weather usually made her feel safe. At home. But today was different. No matter how hard she tried, she couldn't forget Papa's words. Someone did this. They circled in her head like a buzzing black fly. Papa must have noticed her mood, because once his chores were done, he poked his head into the lodge and beckoned. Come, Suzette, I want to take some fur to the post. Shall we go find your old friend, Monsieur Roussain, and see about your summer lessons? Suzette scrambled to her feet and joined him outside. Oh, oui, Papa, yes! She was eager to visit the clerk who gave her French lessons. Grandmother, who was arranging the area between their wigwams, where she would build the cook fire, shook her head. Philippe, your daughter should spend her time learning how to make some Ojibwe man a good wife one day. Papa put an arm around Grandmother's shoulders. But Grandmother, with such a teacher as you, how could Suzette not be well prepared? Grandmother shook her head again, but she couldn't hide her smile. Papa hoisted a bundle of furs onto his shoulder, and he and Suzette set off across the meadow toward the stockade. "'I want to get most of my furs safe in the trading post and marked in a ledger,' he whispered to Suzette. "'But I've hidden a few bundles in the woods. Captain Damboise won't close the competition until the voyagers arrive. I'll bring my hidden furs in at the last minute, eh? I don't want anyone to know how many furs Philippe Choudoir has for the competition.' "'Monsieur Roussain will be impressed by the quality of your furs, I know.' "'and I'll be glad to see him again.' "'Papa smiled. "'I'm glad you enjoy your French lessons. "'I'll arrange lessons for Charlotte, too, when she's old enough. "'Papa, why don't other voyagers teach their children to read and write?' "'Papa paused to better balance the load he was carrying. "'Well, most of my voyager friends come from poor families. "'They can barely read and write themselves. "'But since my father was a merchant in Montreal, "'he could afford to send me to school. "'That's why I know how important reading and writing can be.' Suzette frowned, trying to understand. It's hard to explain, Mignon, Papa sighed. Life is very different in Montreal. Ojibwe people are respected if they give away their possessions to people in need. But where I come from, the most important people are those who hold on to their money and possessions. Suzette felt baffled. What kind of place was this, where selfishness was honored? Papa shook his head. Then he grinned, his blue eyes dancing. Well, rich or not, your papa was too restless to study. I ran away from school, and from Montreal, too, eh? So I could become a voyageur and marry your mama. He was still chuckling as they reached the rough log walls of the stockade. As they passed through the gate, Suzette looked around eagerly. Papa said Fort La Pointe was a small outpost compared to some of the other trading posts, but it still seemed grand to Suzette. Look, Papa, they've built the carpenter a larger shop, she exclaimed. They paused for a moment, looking for other changes, but the other post buildings were just as she remembered. One long, low building included the store and attached storage room, the carpentry strop, and a workshop with a small blacksmith's anvil. Facing those were quarters for Captain Damboise and Monsieur Roussain. The French soldiers stationed at La Pointe and the French laborers who hauled away heavy loads and kept the fort in good repair slept in crowded rooms beyond. The buildings were all made of vertical logs pounded into the ground like tree trunks, their slanted roofs covered with strips of cedar bark. It must be very strange to live in buildings like that, Suzette mused, thinking of their cozy lodges. What would it be like to live within such solid walls? Would she still be able to smell a rain coming? Hear the ice begin to drip in the night during the first spring thaw? Add wood to the fire without leaving the warmth of her sleeping robes? I don't think I'd like it. 
I'm happier in our wigwam, too, Papa smiled. Come on. They found Monsieur Rousain, the post clerk, in the store. The small room smelled of tobacco and wood smoke. Monsieur Roussain was working at the counter. Ceiling high shelves lined all four walls. Suzette saw at once how few goods, cloth for new shirts, iron kettles, pretty silver ear bobs, were left on the shelves. Monsieur Roussain was probably as eager for the voyager's arrival as Papa. Ah, Philippe, the clerk grinned, pushing aside a ledger as they came inside. And my friend Suzette, comment allez-vous? How are you? Très bien, merci, she responded. I am very well, thank you. She pinched the sides of her deerskin dress and bobbed up and down in something called a curtsy, as he had taught her. Papa dumped his stiff furs on the counter. Here are more furs for my account. The finest, of course. But I also wanted to make arrangements for Suzette's lessons. Monsieur Roussain was a thin man, very tall. He sat down on his stool so he didn't tower over them. We can start this afternoon if you'd like. The clerk smiled at Suzette, then looked back to Papa with a twinkle in his eyes. Although, Philippe, your friends will probably tease you again for this. I want the best for Suzette, Papa said simply. I think more French people will be coming to this country. Being able to read and write the language can only help her, even if she is a girl. And people didn't put as much value on girls having an education as on boys having an education back in these days. Suzette didn't care why Papa did this for her. She was just glad that he did. Reading amazed her. To think that someone she had never met could make tiny marks on a piece of paper and she could know what he had been thinking. Papa couldn't afford to pay Monsieur Roussain, so the two men worked out a trade. Fresh fists delivered weekly and a new pair of moccasins that Mama had volunteered to make in exchange for the lessons. I'll be back with more furs, Papa promised Roussain before he left. And make sure these get credited to the right account, eh? I've got Suzette here to keep me straight, Roussette. Roussain laughed. Suzette, do you want to record your papa's furs? Come back behind the counter. Roussain often had her practice writing and arithmetic by helping keep his ledgers. They were huge leather-bound account books brought all the way from Montreal. Suzette opened a ledger on the counter and carefully leafed through until she found the page where Monsieur Roussain had written Philippe Choudoir across the top. Each visit Papa had made to the trading post was noted on the page. The date, how many pelts he'd brought, and what supplies he'd taken. He already had many pelts to his credit. Holding her breath, she carefully dipped the clerk's quill pen in the ink pot and listed the six beaver pelts that Papa had just brought. Her writing was not nearly as fine as Monsieur Roussain's, but it was exciting to add to Papa's list. The clerk smiled. Very good, Suzette. I'll just toss these furs into the storage room. Now that the weather's finally cleared and more people are crossing, I've got lots of pelts coming in. Roussain opened a door behind the counter, and the musky odor of raw pelts spilled into the store. He stepped inside the narrow room where he stored the furs. Standing in the doorway, Suzette watched him drop Papa's beaver pelts onto a waist-high pile. In the middle of the room, two laborers were busy packing some of the loose furs into huge bales. Voyagers would paddle the bales back to warehouses in faraway Montreal. Suzette shivered with excitement. Soon they would be packing Papa's furs into bales. Who would wear the hats made from Papa's beaver pelts? Those distant strangers would never know that these very furs had helped Philippe Choudoir win a trader's competition. Suzette spent the afternoon in the store with the clerk, then wandered back to her lodge. More families had arrived from the mainland. All through the camp, Suzette could see cook fires burning. Some boys had started a noisy round of the game called Bagadoui by the Ojibwe and Lacrosse by the French. At home, she found Grandmother boiling wild rice in an iron kettle over the fire. Mama was tending several fish roasted on sharpened sticks near the flames. Papa, Yellowing, and some friends were playing a game nearby, trying to guess whether partly scorched sticks would fall right side up when tossed. Charlotte watched from her cradle board, propped against a log. Suzette tried to convince herself that everything was as it should be, but she still heard the echoes of Papa's words as he bent over the damaged canoe that morning. Someone did this. Who would want to hurt her family? Who could have done such a thing? That night, long after settling on her sleeping blankets, she heard Papa and Mama creep from the lodge. Through the bulrush matting that formed the walls of the wigwam, she could see light glimmering as they blew the fire back to life. A moment later, she called a faint whiff of tobacco. Papa had lit his pipe. Suzette pulled herself up on one elbow. 
She could just barely hear her mother speak. It's late, Mama murmured. You should sleep. I can't. A silence. Then, you're worried about the canoe? Of course I am, Papa burst out, then lowered his voice. How can I not be? My family was put in danger. Suzette could have drowned. In the long pause that followed, Suzette pictured her father puffing on his pipe, staring at the embers of their fire. She did it for you, Philippe, Mama said. She's afraid you'll have to leave us. I may have to paddle back to Montreal in the fall, he said slowly, but I'll be back in the spring, Shining Stone. I will always come back. There was another pause. Some Frenchmen don't, Mama said finally. You know it as well as I. And so does Suzette. Suzette felt suddenly cold, and she burrowed beneath her warm blankets and furs, wishing her parents would stop talking and come inside. I will always come back. Papa's voice was hushed but firm. I have no wish to go back to Montreal, and I am too stubborn to get sick or hurt on the journey, eh? Mama murmured something Suzette couldn't hear. Oh, Shining Stone, suddenly Papa sounded weary. The last thing I wanted was to bring sadness to those I love. I know your mother wanted you to marry an Ojibwe man. Grandmother had advised Mama not to marry Papa? Suzette had never heard that before. She wished she hadn't heard it now. As she stared at the shadows flickering on the birch bark above her, a chill began to gather in the pit of her stomach.